All right, line A1, learning task number 12. We're going to go and take a look at the features of capacitors. I cannot overemphasize how important it is to understand what capacitors are once we start going into DC. We are going to go and do a lot of industrial electronics inside of second, third, and fourth year. And almost all of those electronic circuits are going to deal with DC capacitors, with what the build is, what they're doing, how they're storing charge, and how then they're taking charge and you know dissipating it back into the circuit. So capacitors are going to be used in some of our AC theory. We're going to use them for power factor correction and a bunch of other components, uh, but we are also going to use them heavily inside of DC circuitry. We're going to cover them in DC first, then we're going to go and take them into AC. They have got completely different applications when used in DC compared with what they're going to be used in AC. But ultimately, no matter what the application is, we're going to be able to go and sum up the fact that any capacitor is going to go and oppose opposes a change in x using x. We've used this type of formula, and I will fill in those blanks in a second. We've used this uh, type of formula before to go and describe an inductor. And we said that an inductor Go back. This is review. An inductor opposes a change in current by using voltage. Right? It uh, likes to keep its current at the same levels, and so it's going to go and collapse its lines of flux, or it's going to slow down, you know, by expanding those lines of flux. But it's going to use voltage to try to oppose any change in current. That was our inductor. Now, as we go into our capacitor, we're going to use the same thing. But remember how these things are opposites. A capacitor opposes a change in voltage by using current. That's what we're going to be looking at developing, is how the soap capacitor is going to oppose any change in voltage by utilizing current. Let's start by our description of a capacitor. A capacitor is a component. It's the very first sentence, a highlightable, usable sentence over here. It's expressly made to store electric energy in the field, and where it says in the field, I want you to right above there, write in the distortion of the field between its plates and in the distortion of the atoms within its dielectric. And it's gonna do that by just charging plates that we are going to go and have. Capacitors are always gonna be made up of two parallel plates. What we have over here is our simplest form of capacitor, two parallel plates that are gonna be separated by a dielectric. And a dielectric is any type of insulator. It could be anything from air, through to glass, ceramic, uh, chemical buildups, oxides that we're going to go and take a look at later on. Anything that is going to go and separate those two plates. The plates themselves cannot be touching. If the plates touch, it's a conductor, not a capacitor. If the plates don't touch, it's a capacitor. The ratio of the charge on the plates to the voltage between the plates is really what defines what capacitance is going to go and be. And this is going to be given to us inside of this formula. C is equal to my Q divided by my V that I'm going to go and have over here. In other words, the capacitance that I'm going to go and have is going to be defined by the charge on coulombs. Remember, coulombs is a discrete, it's a quantity of electrons uh, over top of the voltage that is going to be necessary to charge it up to those values. So we're just going to go and say, how many volts did it take for us to go and stuff this many electrons onto there? We're going to have some types of capacitors that are going to have an easy to distort dielectric. And so it's going to go and take a small amount of volts, just a tiny little bit of volts, to go and store a large amount of coulombs on there. We would say that that would have a high capacitance. We're going to have other ones where we are going to go and need to have a high amount of volts to store a tiny amount of charge on top of it. And as a result, we're going to go and have something that we would say would be a low value of capacitance. We'll go through these in formula and in theory how they all are set up. But for now, that is a big, big formula for us that C is equal to my Q divided by my V that I'm going to go and have. Capacitors are going to be rated in farads. And the farad is a really large amount of capacitance, a large amount of coulombs that we would go and have uh, stored. So usually we're going to go and see stuff that is going to be well below, not just 
the actual, here's my, my zero. We're going to go below the milli section. That's my milli, the thousandths. And then we're going to go into the micro. That's that funny looking U. Then we're going to go into my nano. And then we are going to go down into my pico over here. Most of our caps are going to go and be inside of this range. Most of our small caps. We do have some large ones that will go up into the uh, millifarads, but those are ridiculously large capacitors. Uh, we're going to have some, you know, of our medium sized ones that are going to be inside of our micro, but the bulk of them are going to be down inside of there, where we're looking in the billionths and trillionths of a component, you know, of a ferret is really what we're going to be working at inside of these. All these capacitors are going to go and have what's referred to as a working voltage. A working voltage is simply going to be a measure of its dielectric strength, whatever we place in between that. We talked about in the previous video about how we can take any sort of dielectric, and if we exceed the working value, we stretch out those orbitals, right? We've got our nucleus, we're going to have electrons, and if we stretch them too far, ting, we're just going to break that band, we're going to put that thing into conduction. That's what our working voltage is going to go and be. Uh, remember that anytime that we use these inside of AC, that our AC is always going to be measured inside of our effective value or our RMS. And in reality, it comes to a peak that's going to be much higher. Take your RMS divided by 0.707 and that's going to be your peak. In other words, if I wanted to use this cap on what we would refer to as a 120 volt system, I would have to go and take that 120 divided by 0.707 which would get me out to a value of 170. So I would need to make sure that I've got at an absolute minimum something that is going to be good for 170 volts. Now, when the uh, manufacturer rates these things, it's all going to be available on their data sheets, you know, what the working voltage and minimums, maximums, etc., are going to go and be. Okay, let's go through this formula here and see how this formula relates to what we have on our capacitors. C is equal to Q over top of V. We are going to go and see that we are going to have a direct relationship between our plate area that we are going to go and have. Because we see that the capacitance of a capacitor is based upon the number of electrons that I can go and store. Obviously, if I've got a plate that is only that big, I can only store a certain number of electrons onto that plate. But as soon as I go and make that plate much bigger, I can store more electrons onto that plate, which means that I can go to a greater amount of Q. So the bigger my plate is, the more capacitance that I'm going to go and have. If I take a look at my spacing that I'm going to go and have in between my plates, that's also going to go and make a big difference to my capacitance. My capacitance is going to be inversely proportional to the spacing. We see that as I would bring these two together, the force between the two is going to go up. What's the force? Well, the force is going to be measured inside of volts that we are going to go and have. So if I bring these plates together, I'm going to go and see a greater amount of voltage that is going to be, it's going to be stronger voltage field that's going to be across here. Therefore, if the denominator of a fraction goes up, the result has to go down. I'm going to go and see less capacitance that's going to be out of these. We're also going to go and have, based upon the type of dielectric that we are going to go and have in between the plates. So whatever this dielectric that I'm separating these with is going to go and be, I'm going to have uh, a difference in the amount that I'm going to be able to distort. We talked in our previous learning task there, number um, 11 there, we talked about how we can go and distort certain types. For a certain type of voltage, let's say that we've got a voltage of 12 volts right now, certain types of material are going to distort a lot, other types of material are only going to go and distort a little bit. If I only get a little bit of distortion, that means that I'm only going to go and get a little bit of force towards, you know, the one end compared to the other. This one over here, this type of material distorts less, therefore I'm going to go and have less force that's going to be seen on these actual places themselves. So the type of dielectric that I'm going to go and have is going to go and define the total amount of coulombs and define the total amount of volts, right? If it doesn't distort very well, it's going to have a low value of voltage and it is going to go and have a low value of 
coulombs. So that's going to be on. If it distorts really well, we're going to go and hold a high value of coulombs, etc. So it's going to be a physical bill based upon what we have for plate area, plate separation, and the actual component that's going to be between the plate. And what we can do is we can go and take all of this and we can convert it into another formula. Take a look at how similar this new formula is going to go and be. The top of this formula, C, is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 times K times A that I'm going to go and have. The top part of this all defines Coulomb charge. 8.85 is going to be the permittivity of free air. K is going to go just be what I have in between the, uh, the plates, so the type of material. Every type of material is going to be compared to air. How good is it at storing an electrostatic field compared to air? So if I have got just air in between, I would put my K in as 1, because then it's just 1 times the permittivity of air. But I'm going to have other ones that are going to be far better than air, so they're going to go and have higher K values. You know, they might be 100 times, or they might be 1,000 times, or whatever it's going to go and be. All of that is going to go and define my Q that I'm going to go and have. If I take a look at the bottom side, I see that the bottom side is going to be based upon the distance. We know that as the distance between the two plates goes down, the amount of voltage that we are going to see is going to go up across. And that's really what we're seeing over here is that this D is going to go and correspond to the B that we have over here. It is simply a physical rewriting of the same formula, except now instead of just calling this Q, we're defining all the individual components that make up Q. Permittivity, that's the K times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, and the area, the amount of space that we have on top of there, and the voltage is defined off the distance that we are going to go and have in between these. The amount of capacitance that I'm going to go and have is going to be based upon these physical constants. And you need to go and get this uh, formula, you know, found on your ITA sheet. And if you can't find it, you got to memorize it because it is going to be critical to what we're going to look at later on as we start to change our types of capacitors. Note that all of the areas are once again in meters. So for everything we've covered this year has been meters, meters squared for my area on this one. And my distance between as being in meters, same as what we had for our inductors, right? We saw that inductors were all measured inside of meters as well. Core area in square meters and my length, my active uh, length that I was going to have of the core in meters as well. Capacitors are going to be defined as symbols. Now, usually we will go and have this curved bar that's going to be on the bottom or what we're going to refer to as our common. It is not always going to be identified on every capacitor like that. We will see some that are going to go and appear as parallel plates like that. If I've got a parallel plate on a drawing, it means it's a non-polarized capacitor. A non-polarized capacitor can be placed into a circuit in either direction. It can be really confusing because it looks like a normally open set of contacts. So you just have to be you know, aware. If it is identified with a C, it's probably going to go and be a capacitor that we are going to have. Also look at you know, what it's actually doing. So it's, it takes a little bit of your knowledge as an electrician to be able to interpret when we see a symbol like this, are we looking at contacts or are we looking at a capacitor inside of there? This is non-polarized. This would be what we refer to as a polarized capacitor. A polarized capacitor has got definite positives and negatives. If I were to go and look at an actual capacitor, a lot of them are gonna be you know, these round kind of film can sort of looks that we have. Uh, you're going to go and see a couple different things that are going to go and define them. Usually we are going to go and have the can is going to be all one solid color except for one red stripe that's going to be down the side of that thing. Uh, that red stripe that you're seeing is going to go and define the negative. The red stripe, or it's going to be identified, sometimes it's going to go and have dashes down there. That's not a seam, that's supposed to be negatives. The other way that we go and define the negative on a polarized capacitor is that it is going to go and have a short length. Pretty much all of my electronic components, LEDs, capacitors, anything like that that's going to be polarized, if it's got a short leg, that's a negative. Just think about it this way, if I cut off your leg and it was shorter, that would be a negative. Probably a negative thing that would happen in your life, right? I did think people would find it to be a negative. That's how I remember that any short legs are always going to go and be the negative. This symbol is going to be for a fixed capacitor, a polarized fixed capacitor. You can use 
polarized capacitors inside of a DC circuit, you cannot use a polarized capacitor inside of an AC circuit because the AC changes its polarity. I can use a non-polarized inside of a AC or inside of a DC circuit because it doesn't matter. Usually it's going to be ceramic or something like that that's going to be in between. We also have got this symbol over here, which is going to be for my variable type of capacitor. Uh, we've got a couple different ways that we vary them. And then we've got this one, which is also a variable one. Note the little arrowhead on here. It's going to be for a trimmer type of capacitor. Two different ways that we are going to go and vary these types. Talking about our fixed capacitors, before we go into that, uh, fixed capacitors are going to have our metal plates that are going to be separated by a dielectric or an insulator. Insulators are commonly going to be paper, usually a paper that's going to be uh, soaked in some sort of a insulating type of material like an oil base. We will use mica, which is a mineral base. We will use mylar, which is a plastic base, or we will go and use ceramic glass or things like that. Ceramic capacitors are really popular for the fact that they've got an incredibly high dielectric strength, um, but they don't hold a lot of capacitance. So you have to have you know fairly large ceramics, but they're going to be non-polarized. Talking about our different types, and we'll come back to this one here with the, the symbols on the variable and the trimmer. For simple fixed capacitors, if we've got an oil-filled capacitor, which are going to be used in large, older types of installations, we don't see a lot of them, but they're going to be a big can. It looks like an old army um, ammo can in a lot of cases. Big square things are going to have a bunch of plates in a configuration that's going to be similar to this, where they're going to have plates that are going to just be suspended inside of a freely moving oil inside of here. Sometimes they would also go and have what they refer to as um, saturated ones or Sometimes they would even call them dry. They weren't actually dry. They would just be, you know, paper that would be soaked in oil. And they would do that under vacuum to go and pull out any sort of air bubbles. Whatever you have, if it is an oil-filled capacitor, those oil-filled capacitors are usually going to go and have something that's going to lower the flammability. Because if I've got electricity, and if I take that whole set of electricity and I soak that inside of oil, the oil is going to go and insulate. But if I get an arc inside of there, I've now created a pipe bomb. Right? Oil is combustible inside of an arc, you know, 3,000 degrees, boom, stuff blows up. So what they will do in a lot of oil-filled equipment is they are going to go and lower the flash point. They're going to make the oil less burning, you know, is really what it is. And they'll do that by adding in PCBs. If you've got oil-filled capacitors, be very careful about what you do with that oil, how you take them down. Don't spill that oil. You've got a bunch of disposal stuff that you're going to have to do. Usually those ones are going to be found inside of high voltage systems, so not really a worry of most of our electricians out there. A few people work in that high voltage field. If you do, just be aware of that. We've also got dry types. Uh, dry types uh, that is going to be self-healing is going to be like this. Now, this one does have a little bit of an error. They're showing that, look, we're going to go and have an aluminum foil. We're going to have an aluminum foil, and then we're going to go and have plastic that's going to be in between that. And it's plastic where we just vaporize a very small amount of metal onto it. Um, they're showing this thing rolled all the way up like that, but then right here at the center, they show those two plates as being connected together. It kind of like curls around like that inside of the center. That should be separated because the two plates are supposed to be separated. So inside of your drawing over there, just go and, you know, X that center out over there because they should not be connected. Because right now, if you follow one of these lines all the way through, You'll be able to follow it all the way into the inside, and then you're going to be able to go and follow it all the way back out to the outside. It's conductor as drawn. Just small minutia, but yeah, mark that inside of there. When we have got these dry self-healings, the plastic that is inside there is relatively soft. The metal that's on there is going to go and be my conductive plate. The plastic acts as my dielectric that is going to be in between that. Uh, and if I get a fault, see if I get a little bit of puncturing where the plastic has gotten weak, I'll get a little arc through there. That arc will go and vaporize the plastic and it'll burn itself back from the edges. We call it self-healing. It's not really self-healing. It's uh, It doesn't heal the problem. It goes and it just deals with the problem. It gets less and less capacitive. The more and more punctures that we have, the more and more plate area that we're going to go and evaporate. And as we drop our plate area, as we just covered, C is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 times K times A. What I'm going to be seeing happen, all over the top of D, is that my plate area is going to be dropping and my plate constant is going to be dropping as well because now I'm going to have air inside of some of those sections and air is a poor dielectric. 
So they clear the faults, they're, they're self-clearing, but they don't necessarily heal and come back to the same thing. Over time, they do degrade as we lose more and more sections inside of these. We do have one that is truly self-healing, and the one that is truly self-healing is going to be similar to our oil filled, except we're not going to go and use oil. We are going to go and use aluminum, and the aluminum is going to go and have what we refer to as an electrolyte. Electrolyte is a type of chemical that can carry electricity. That electrolyte is going to go and cause aluminum rust or oxide. Uh, rust is nothing more than iron oxide that we have and it's corrosion that builds up. If you have worked in the field long enough, you will have probably terminated aluminum conductors before. And you know that when you're terminating aluminum conductors, you always, always, always use penetrox or nolax or some other type of antioxidant component. And the reason that we use that antioxidant component is because when aluminum oxidizes or is exposed to oxygen, the second it's exposed to oxygen, it builds up this tiny little bit of rust, aluminum rust that's going to be on the surface. So we'll just pretend it's there aluminum. That tiny little bit of aluminum rust that builds up on the surface is actually ridiculously high resistance. And that high resistance now means that any time that I'm passing current through, this is my aluminum conductor and it's inside of my lug over here, now there is a small resistance in between. <clears throat> First of all, it is going to be a small amount of parasitic capacitance. But secondly, any current that's going through, let's say it's my 100 amp panel lugs over here, that, that current that as it travels through here is going to go and drop some watts, right? I squared R. If I've got resistance at that joint and I've got 100 amps going through there, I'm going to go and have heat that's going to go and come off of that joint as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh. Too much talking. <coughs> Not enough coffee here. I'm starting to dry out. Um, when we take a look at uh, that oxide layer, we want to get rid of it. On our conductors, we use the penetrox or the donalax. In this case, we want to go and create that oxide layer over here, that high resistance, because when we create that high resistance, it is a form of insulation. So we allow the oxide to go and build up. And when the oxide builds up, and when we initially start current flow, there will be current flow between these two plates. So I'll stick a negative here, and I'll stick a positive here. We will have current flow that is going to go between these two plates, but as the current flows, we're going to go and build up this oxide all around this plate over here. And that oxide now forms our dielectric that we have inside of here. So when initially started, there'll be current flow, but then the current drops away. So my current just drops away because we build up that oxide and we stop flowing current. If there is any sort of an actual puncture on my oxide layer, it'll just build new oxide into that section. These are truly self-healing. They do have another one that's called the dry type. The dry type is going to be using electrolyte, but it's not going to be liquid like, you know, sloshing around type of electrolyte. They're just going to take it and they're going to soak it into uh, some sort of a mat. Like if you're familiar with your automotive at all, absorb glass mat batteries, the same type of thing. We're going to take a gauze and we're going to soak it inside of the electrolyte that holds it in place so it doesn't slosh around. It also uses capillary action to go and make sure that it's like pulling it up as well. These are polarity sensitive because they build the oxide layer on one side only, which means that if I were to reverse my polarity over here, this oxide layer is going to go and disappear from this side over here. And then once it's disappeared, it starts to build on this side. But there's going to be that point where as we have stripped it away from the one side, starts to build it on the other side, that this thing is now going to be you know, completely uh, strict, it's going to act as a short circuit because the electrolyte can go and carry all of that current through. This is going to be far called puncturing, so we want to be careful about how we connect them in. If I do it in a controlled manner, I can reverse the polarity on one of these and build that current, you know, uh, or build that oxide by passing a controlled amount of current through there. But usually we don't do that. We do use electrolytic capacitors in AC, and an electrolytic capacitor in AC is simply going to be a set of polarized back to back electrolytic capacitors so that as I am <clears throat> positive negative over here I am going to go and be building this one over here is going to be puncturing this one over here is going to be building its layer of oxide and then as my AC changes over and I go negative positive like that now this one is going to be puncturing as this one is going to be building so always one of them is going to be building that resistance inside of it. 
they <clears throat> they can do this almost an infinite number of times because all it is is just a movement it's a chemical recombination and then a chemical stripping as long as they stay sealed and they don't dry out they're going to be able to do this for a long period of time usually when these electrolytic capacitors go bad it's because they have dried out there's been some sort of a small leak and over time the electrolyte has dried out and hardened variable capacitors are going to be defined off of two main uh, ways when we go back to these variables over here we saw that we had variable versus our trimmer these are going to be defined off of whether we are going to be adjusting either the plate area or whether we are going to be adjusting the plate distance that we are going to go and have either one of these is going to allow us to go and change the amount of capacitance the trimmer is going to go and usually have a small screw on the top that's like these ones over here um, both these ones here by the way these ones can be either the plate type that are moving inside there or they can be the trimmer type but it's going to go and move the plates closer together or move the plates further away which is going to go and change my capacitance the other one the variable is going to go and have uh, sets of plates that are going to be in like a half moon type of shape over here so these ones down here can't really see them but it's a half moon set of plates over here you see these ones are all tied together up top over here and they don't make contact but as I turn the shaft this set of half moon plates over here is going to go and overlap the more that they overlap the more effective plate area that we have the less that they overlap the less effective plate area that we have same with these ones over here where we are going to go and have a half moon shape that we can go and take over the top and then back out of these ones as well when caps do have problems, uh, it's going to be one of you know several. The most common one that you're going to go and have is shorts. Your dielectric can only go and have so much stress placed upon it. The insulation, if we go above that, it is going to go and turn into a conductor. At that point, we'd call this thing a short. If it is a large capacitor, this can be a very violent uh, reaction. Usually it's going to be an explosion and the capacitor can itself is going to go and rupture. Some cases fire, etc. Leaky is a, another thing where my capacitor just starts to pass small amounts of current through, you know, voids or holes or issues that it has inside of its dielectric. Uh, it's not completely shorted out. It is going to still provide some capacitance, but it's also going to have some current that's going through it. Electrolytic capacitors, if they have not been used in a while, will be leaky because they're just going to have recombined the chemical, the electrolyte inside there is going to have, you know, through just free exchange, created some place that it's going to be weak. So if I've got a component that has got capacitors inside it that has not been uh, utilized for a while, I need to allow those capacitors to get past that leaky stage. If I operate in a leaky stage, it's going to screw the capacitors. A big component that is going to go and have capacitors is going to be my VFDs, my variable frequency drives. Anytime that you've got a motor drive, that motor drive is going to go and have capacitors inside of it. You'll learn about the guts of them inside of third year. But what you need to know right now is that those guts contain a big old capacitor or sometimes multiple capacitors that are going to be inside there. If that VFD is just off the shelf from the wholesaler, or if it's you know on a piece of equipment that hasn't been used since last season, let's say you're working in like uh uh, fruit processing here in the Fraser Valley or something like that, they're going to go and have season and then leave these things. Anytime that you power it up, you need to let that thing sit for a little bit before you start pulling current through it. Because as you start pulling current through it, you start getting a lot of dynamic movement on those capacitor plates. So take anything that's going to be drives, power them up, leave them for a couple of hours to a day, if possible, before you start operating them if they are something that is you know, brand new. If you know that you're gonna to have to bring something out to a customer and they wanna operate it right away, if you got the chance, just put it onto power in the shop. You should have a test bench in your shop somewhere. Just power it up, let it you know, kind of charge there if you can, then take that thing down, take it over and install, et cetera. It's just gonna go and do what we call recondition the capacitors inside there. The other thing that contains capacitors is gonna be electronics. Uh, this is why you know sometimes electronics, computers that have been, you know, taken out of service and then put back in can sometimes have power uh, supply failures and usually it's just going to be a capacitor that has been dried out and it goes and gets powered up again it's leaky and then we start pulling current out of it too quickly sometimes you will get an open an open is always going to be a disconnection of one of the leads inside of there it's not going to be the plate it would be really hard for a complete plate to go and turn open 
Another thing that we are going to go and have is stray capacitance. Stray capacitance is really any type place that we get capacitive action that we did not mean for it to go and happen. Every set of conductors is going to go and have capacitance because if I take a look at a set of conductors with a red and a black line one, line two, around the outside of each of those conductors, we are going to go and have our insulation. And that insulation, oh man, I'm getting way too close together. Let me try that one more time. Red conductor, here is my black conductor. And here's my insulation around that one and my insulation around that one. All of that insulation is a form of dielectric, right? Especially if we would be using this on a DC type of system where I'm going to go and have a positive and a negative over here. If that's a DC system, I'm going to have distorted all those little mini orbitals around the outside of that, and they're going to be acting as if they were a capacitor, particularly if these cables were going to be both sitting on top of something grounded or inside of a grounded metal casing. So we'll get stray capacitance that happens. Sometimes it can cause erratic circuit operation. The other issue that we have with our insulation is this thing that's going to be called dielectric absorption. And that's going to be if I've got a DC bus over here where I'm going to be for a long time running this thing as a positive, this thing as a negative, I'm going to go and have all of these that are going to be distorted in relationship to ground. They always distort in relationship to ground. When I depower the system, I don't necessarily discharge all of that capacitance that's going to be on there. Even if I do discharge that capacitance, it can sometimes go and spring back to remember the dielectric is plastic. And if you take a piece of plastic, bend it and then keep it bent for, you know, a couple of months to a couple of years or something like that. You know that when you remove that force, that plastic is probably going to stay deformed. It's just formed a memory of that shape. That's what happens inside of here is that the dielectric can get absorbed into there. It can be a really, really big problem, particularly in high voltage cables where I can kill a cable, shut it off. And then when I go to work on it, all of a sudden, whack, you get this huge capacitive kick that's going to come off of it because it had dielectric absorption. Capacitor handling has to be done with care because they do store voltage. We're going to look at more of that voltage storage in a little bit here. Uh, but because they do store voltage, they can go and damage you or damage the capacitor uh, if they're handled improperly. If you put too high of a voltage across it, you're obviously going to break down that dielectric. You can blow that thing up. If I go and discharge a capacitor, so let's say I've got an actual charged up capacitor, and I decide that I'm going to go and short these two leads together, what happens is we get a massive amount of current that's going to go and flow. Remember that left-hand rule. We're going to have magnetic fields that are going to happen as well. Those magnetic fields are going to cause actual physical, you know, we're going to have like movement back and forth on these as those magnetic fields are going to be repelling from each other and attracting towards others. And so a rapid discharge of a cap can go and result in physical movement inside of that cap that's going to go and lead to shorting. You know, all we need is that two of these get pushed so close together that they make contact. Now we've got a short circuit and boom, it's going to go and blow up inside of there. Do not discharge them by using, you know, a screwdriver across the terminals or something like that. I, it's just highly dangerous. Use a proper, you know, like high ohmic rating, 10k ohms to 50k ohms. You want to have something that's going to be a couple watts. You'll use that to go and discharge any sort of a cap. Before you handle them, discharge them. And then after that, short circuit the leads. Once you have it completely discharged, you're going to stick a short across it so that if there is any dielectric absorption, that it's not going to build up to any valuables so that's going to be able to go and hit you again. And once again, if working with oil fill, be very careful what you do with that oil and how you just uh, get, get rid of it. They give you a bunch of brand names inside of here. Ascaral, Pyronal, Chlorido, Chlorotech, Extol, uh, Arlchlor, Noflamol, Inertine are a bunch of older names of oil filled capacitors. If you've got an oil filled piece of equipment and it does not have PCBs inside of it, the manufacturer makes that very clear. They write no PCBs, or they might go and do that, you know, circle-y thing with, with the line through no PCBs. If you don't see no PCBs or PCB free or no PCBs or that circle thing, go with the assumption that it has PCBs inside of there. Make sure that it is disposed of according to regulation. You got to take this in and it's got to be treated as hazardous materials. I'm not going to try to go through those regulations. It's a completely separate thing. 
you're going to have to look up underneath uh, work safe and underneath our provincial health and safety guidelines how to deal with those hazardous ones and then make sure that you properly do so. All right, that is it for our features. Let's move on to our operation.